Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, welcome to the IRIS International Film Club event for April titled Language Learning Online, Films and Podcasts. I'm Danielle Chasse and I'm honored to be the moderator today. I'm in my 18th year of teaching Spanish at Oconomowoc High School. I currently teach Spanish in the International Baccalaureate Program, as well as a bilingual course called Global Sustainability, which is a course I co-teach with my AP Environmental Science colleague. I'm also our school's Global Scholars Program Coordinator. Today's sponsor is the Institute for Regional and International Studies National Resource Center. IRIS NRC Outreach supports international and global awareness and inspires informed thinking about the complexities of our world by providing resources and expertise to K-12 and post-secondary educators and students and the community at large. Thank you to our co-sponsors for today's film club, WISLI, or the Wisconsin Intensive Summer Language Institutes, the Language Institute at UW-Madison, and the Wisconsin Association for Language Teachers, or WAFLD. Carmen Pitts will be running tech support if you have any challenges, please use the chat function to contact her. We will be recording today's event and sharing the link and digital resources in a post event email. You will only show on the recording if your microphone is turned on to speak. During the presentation, please feel free to enter questions in the chat box, which we will address during the question and answer time later on. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kate Grover Griss. Kate is a skilled online ed language ed instructor with over 10 years of experience teaching hybrid and online courses. She is proficient in effective technology integration and practice in providing professional development and mentoring for faculty that are new to hybrid, online, and multimodality teaching. Driven by a passion for professional development, she became certified as an online instructor in 2012 when she completed the e-learning and online teaching graduate certificate at the University of Wisconsin Stout. In her current position as a Spanish professor at Madison Area Technical College, she has developed and taught introductory, intermediate, and advanced Spanish courses in a variety of formats, including face-to-face, -face, hybrid, online, and accelerated. She specializes in designing and implementing high quality online instruction with a focus on equity, inclusion, student engagement, and success. With that, I will turn it over to Kate. Thank you so much, Danielle, for that wonderful introduction. Thanks to our sponsors and thanks to all of you for being here today. We are going to put you to work a bit. So if you would join me in Mentimeter, you can do this in one of two ways. If you have a mobile device and you're a QR scanner person, you can scan the code on the screen or you can type in menti.com and put in the code that you see at the top of the screen, which is 87, 71, 75, 3. But we want to get you into Mentimeter so you can participate in the interactive questions and things. We're going to pull on some of your experience and some of your opinions throughout the session today. So we want to make sure you can get in there and do that. So if you want to quickly scan that code uh, or scan that QR code or the at web address and the numerical code will stay on the top of each slide. So don't worry if you don't get it on this slide. <laughs> Just make sure to get in there. Menti.com 87 71 75 3. And welcome. All righty. So in preparation for today's session, you had the invitation to check out Language Latte, which is a professional development podcast about language teaching. And I'm just curious to see what you all thought of that or just in general, how often you use podcasts for professional development. So once you're in the Menti, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us a bit on the scale here. It says, I often listen to podcasts for professional development, strongly disagree or strongly agree. I'd love to see where you stand here on this scale where we're at with podcasts for professional development. Looks like we're hovering in the middle for a bit. We'll give folks a second to go ahead and get in Menti if you haven't already. There'll be several opportunities for you to participate in Menti. So do make sure you get in there. It's menti.com 87, 71, 75, three. And, you know, with this language, um, if you want to use the chat as well throughout, I'll be keeping an eye on that. As, uh, I would just love to hear your thoughts on language latte. If you explored any of those sessions, feel free to put any comments or ideas in the chat from your experience with language latte. 
But it looks like we're kind of in the middle here. Some of us are using podcasts for professional development and some of us, maybe it's kind of a newer or a different thing that we haven't done. But I do think it's a wonderful way for you to take professional development on the road with you. We'll talk about podcasts here in a bit and what some of the reasons are for using them in, especially in today's world. So thanks for participating in our first little uh, questionnaire here in Menti. Today, we're here to talk about language learning online and specifically ways in which we can use films and podcasts. You'll notice throughout the Menti today, you do have some emoticons in the lower right. If you want to express any little emotions here as we go along, the heart and the thumbs up, you simply click on those. And again, we'll have opportunities for you to put more input into the Menti as we go. And with that, let's get started. My name is, Danielle said, is Kate Grovergris. And just a little bit uh, additional things about me you should know. I've been teaching Spanish since 2002, which is many years now. Goodness, time flies. Um, and I definitely practice a method we will look at in just a moment called the case method. And on that note, you'll see that there's a bit.ly address, bit.ly slash films podcasts. You'll be able to type that into your browser after our session today and all the materials will be in there for you. Not only the slides from today, but also some other resources such as kind of a, a jimungus list of podcasts you can use for all different languages, as well as a teacher toolkit for films and a list of about 25 to 30 resources that you can use as a follow-up to today's discussion. So we're definitely going to extend this beyond our session today and give you some resources to explore, as well as my email, of course, and my Twitter handle if you want to keep in touch. And on that note, this is the most important thing to know about me is the case method. I'm just curious to know if anybody else practices the case method and or if you know what it means. So if you want to jump over to Menti, and I know that you can enter, it says one word or something, but actually you have, I think, 25 symbols, which is exactly enough to represent what case stands for, if you happen to want to guess. Anybody want to guess what case stands for? No idea. <laughs> I love it. And I love that folks are right away assuming it's something really awesome. It's actually something that I made up. <laughs> So I love the no idea research method, do not know. That's right. Um, anybody else want to guess? There's an emoji. Yay. We got into it now. <laughs> so case is actually just a little bit of my personality. It stands for copy and steal everything. So it's just a reminder that today you are welcome to copy and steal any ideas or thoughts or things that come up during our session. And please do, in fact, copy and steal everything as we go through today. Love the emojis. So when we talk about online teaching, there's some challenges that we definitely encounter, right? And I've put four of them on the screen. I'd really love for you to kind of rate them as you think they are, you know, in, in order of like number one being maybe the most challenging, number four maybe being the, the least challenging of the four and when it comes to your opinion, right? So go ahead and rate those challenges. But as you look at them, like providing abundant target language input, Definitely a challenge in the online world. We worry about not being live with students as much as we normally are in maybe an on-campus in-person environment. Of course, assessing student learning online, we worry about academic integrity and we have to maybe rethink the way that we assess. Maybe more project-based, maybe more aligned with the way that the online environment is where students have books and notes and friends and Google Translate, right? And also getting students talking. Yeah, we have to really work hard to get them interested enough to talk and feel comfortable talking. These are just definitely some of the challenges we face in the online environment. It looks like so far folks are most concerned about getting students talking. I agree, we know that production is key to oral uh, proficiency development and we, we need that to happen, right? And the assessing of student learning, the building of community, which again, another one of those big challenges. So as we go through our session today, these four challenges can be, you know, somewhat addressed with films and podcasts. So keep these in mind as we dive into some ways we can use films and podcasts, because these definitely can be addressed with those tools. And on that note, we're going to dive right into films. Anybody excited? I love films. I think language teachers love films. Let's see those hearts flow, right, on the emoticons here. Films are so fun, and they really do bring a lot of value to our language classrooms. So in the online learning environment, that's one advantage. We can use films. That is one thing we don't have to lose in this environment. I'm guessing there's some favorite films that you do or would like to use in your language classes. Anybody have any recommendations for folks? 
of, of films that you would recommend and or use or would like to use. I'd love to see those start to appear. Any, <laughs> yes, right? Um, Volver, oh yes, that's a favorite. Wonder, it's a great one. Almost a woman, good. I should note um, that all the things you type into Mentimeter today will be available to you afterwards. About a few hours after our session today, I'll be able to download all the slides with the input you've added and put them into our online folder of materials for you. So if you check again later today or tomorrow, you'll be able to see everyone's input as well. Wonderful, también la lluvia. Do you see any of your favorites? Titanic, <laughs> yeah, that's a really long one, isn't it? Um, which way home, mm -hmm. inside out. Ah, even Cinderella, the classics, right? And some in different languages. Don't be afraid to put them in different languages, right? If you, We'd love to see those different languages represented here. So there are so many films that we all know and love that we'd really love to use in our, in our, in our courses, right? And why do we think it's beneficial to have films in language teaching? I have some ideas of my own, but I'd love to hear your input first. You know, why do you think it is benefic beneficial to have those films in our language teaching? Go ahead and put it into the menti. What comes to mind? What's the sort of first phrase or idea that comes to mind for you? The cultural context, yes. The use of authentic language mm -hmm. for discussion. And I'm wondering if that's just providing a great opportunity to discuss something interesting, right? When we talk about getting students talking, hearing the language in context, yes. The slang, the informal language, the different social registers. Mm -hmm. And for fun, we need to motivate our students. Right? We want them to think it's fun and, and really motivating to be able to understand films. Mm -hmm. The everyday phrases, the accents from different areas, listening skills for sure, developing their listening skills and definitely motivating, stimulating fun mm -hmm. because that's important too. We can't let our students get burned out. So these are some of the benefits that I would love to share with you. Some things on my mind that I think are benefits. The first one is, many of you mentioned, the contextualized language input. We talked about one of the big challenges of online teaching being, you know, getting that, uh, that input, getting a target language input for students. And if we can provide contextualized target language input through films, that's really, really useful. We can also immerse students in what we call real language or what many of you were caught talking about authentic use of the language, right? native speakers and fluent speakers using the language in real life context and the cultural connection, getting students to connect. If we could only take them on field trips all over the world, right? But since we can't, we can often bring those places to them through films. And the pronunciation, now this is interesting too, because many of you mentioned dialects or accents, right? And how that is important too, for them to hear that authentic pronunciation, the words are pronounced in different areas of the world. Also, this one's kind of a big one, the visual context for language. Move, uh, and off, movies and films often allow students to understand more language than they would be able to otherwise because of the visual context. So that's a contrast with podcasts we'll talk about in a bit, but the visual context of films can really help students to kind of scaffold their understanding of what's going on. And of course, what so many of you mentioned, foster the fun, right? Foster the fun, try to find something that students will want to keep learning the language because they found something they enjoy and something that's really a benefit to them. But we also need to talk a little bit about with films that we need to make sure they're well integrated into the curriculum. And with that, we're talking a little bit about that pedagogical purpose. This is a phrase that I'm sure my colleagues at my particular partner are probably sick of hearing me say, but pedagogical purpose, whenever we talk about using media or technology, we definitely have to make sure that it's well integrated. And the way to do that is to really make sure we have a clear pedagogical purpose, right? A clear pedagogical purpose so that it does fully integrate into the curriculum and doesn't just become something that kind of gets you know, plopped in there at the last minute. So one way to do that is to have thematic units. And this is really helpful, I would say, mostly at maybe the intermediate and advanced levels in particular, where you can really have, take like a full length film and turn that into an entire unit for your students, where not only they learn vocabulary related to the film, they learn the historical and cultural context, they learn grammar that allows them to interact with the film, you know, so it becomes its own chapter, if you will, and potentially, um, um, even semester, depending on, you know, how you want to use these types of films. 
Another thing to think about, whoops, sorry, there we go, is the basis um, for project-based learning. So project-based learning is maybe something you all have explored recently, but it really aligns well with the online learning environment where traditional tests sometimes cause us to worry a little bit too much about academic integrity, right? And we worry about those notes and books and friends and Google Translate. But could we design different types of assessments like project-based assessments where those types of things that we have in the online learning environment won't really help, right? I mean, even if they can use Google Translate, will that help them complete their project? Not necessarily, depending on how we set it up. So project-based learning based on films can be really helpful. And we'll talk more about that in a moment, but just keep it in mind as a possible pedagogical purpose. So in thinking about films, and maybe you're familiar with the filming process and how there's often takes, right? When they're making a movie, take one, take two, take three. We're going to use that um, to help us talk about some pitfalls when it comes to using films in the language classroom. So take one, as you know, in a movie is usually not the best one. <laughs> so we're going to look at take one, and then we're going to look at take two, okay, as it relates to these different concepts. Now, the first concept is choosing the film, right, for your, for your class. So when it comes to take one, which again, maybe isn't always the best, sometimes we do look for those blockbusters or award-winning films, often full length, because we think maybe our students have heard of them, maybe they're out in, you know, out in the media and they're seeing it and it might entice them into the language, which definitely it might, right? But maybe isn't totally the, the best approach when it comes to choosing a film. So on that note, let's take two. Here we go choosing the film with a new approach. And it's often best to think more in terms of targeting the vocabulary or the topics that you need to discuss in your course. So if you can think a little bit more in terms of maybe it's not the most award-winning, but it has the right vocabulary and topics included. Also the appropriate difficulty level. So as we think about from beginner to advanced students, we wanna make sure it's accessible to them, which again, might not be those full length blockbuster award-winning movies. It might be something more simple, like a short film or an episodic show, right? So where you can kind of get into it a little bit more easily, especially at a beginning level. So that's just some thoughts about how you might go about choosing the film, take two, right? Another concept is when you're showing the film in your classes, take one, which again, might not be the best, let's take a look. Oftentimes we go in cold, right? And, and I know as a teacher, I've certainly done this where you think, oh, we need a week that's kind of different to breaks up the rest of the semester, <laughs> gives everyone a little break from the normal routine. And so let's show a movie, right? But it often means you're kind of going in cold, right? Here's the movie, let's do this. And often it's start to finish. So go ahead and watch it the entire hour or throughout the week. And you're kind of just going from start to finish without much intermixed in between, any instructions sort of intermixed in there, which does sort of lead to a passive approach, right? Where students are sitting back and just kind of soaking it in. Um, and often in the online environment, it means they're watching it alone because we often in this environment will give folks the link and they'll watch the movies. Um, or they're watching it, but there really isn't any interaction with other folks. So it feels like you're watching it alone. So this is take one of showing the film, but let's see if we can do a little better. Take two, here we go. When we're showing a film, could we approach it this way, where we look at those scaffolding activities? Some of my favorites for scaffolding activities are using clips. So in other words, actually, you know, before they even watch a larger episode or a larger chunk of a movie, you're pulling out little scenes that are kind of key to the movie and having them interact with those clips. In fact, sometimes I actually show the clips without sound first. So I show a quick clip and have students kind of do some predicting. What do you think's going on in there? Or even some writing or interacting or coming up with some dialogue they think might be happening there. So that kind of scaffolding activities as you, as you start to show the film, that just happens to be one of my favorites. Also the divide and conquer. I think it's really wonderful to think outside of the start to finish model. So divide and conquer, can you pull out pieces of the film and in between can it be sort of woven with other forms of instruction, right? So that they get to interact a little bit more and think a little bit more deeply about each part of the film as opposed to just going start to finish and then let's see what you remember. That is more of an active approach, right? So they're not necessarily just sitting back and soaking in a whole film. They know they're gonna be interacting throughout the film. 
And on that note, watch parties are wonderful for online classes. So here in Zoom, you can go ahead and set up a watch party um, and you can have, I think it's best if you maybe don't even have the whole class, you allow them to divide into smaller groups and they each have their own Zoom room and they watch the movie together where they can interact with each other, which we'll talk a little bit more about in just a moment. So that's take two of showing the film. And then there's debriefing, which I just spelled wrong on this slide, but we'll fix that later. Um, as a linguist, that drives me nuts. Here we go. Um, but oftentimes with debriefing the film, we'll have like a worksheet, right, of plot questions. Anybody ever done this? You know, I think since the beginning of time, language teachers have had worksheets of plot questions, <laughs> right? And um, the post viewing discussion. So let's watch the movie and then let's discuss which ends up kind of sometimes being a little more superficial of an overview discussion when it comes to films. So that's take one, but could we do a little better with our take two? Let's see. And I even spelled it right on the take two. There we go. So uh, debriefing the film take two, how can we do a little better? Probably if we do this project-based learning. One of my favorite ways to do this is to have students focus in on a particular character of a movie. And what happens with that is that they become throughout the entire experience of the film, which might be somewhat extended, right? If you're not watching the start to finish model, if you're breaking it up and doing different types of instruction in the middle, where they get to know one character. And perhaps it starts out with where they make a, you know, sort of a, a character, um, a character model, like where they may be, and it, it's fun to be creative, right? So you could even have students sort of draw a picture of the character that they're working on, and maybe around the outside, draw in different things, kind of like a collage that you know about that character. What are their hopes? What are their dreams? What are their personality? And they kind of get to know that character a little bit better. And then maybe later on, they end up writing some sort of a composition about that character or developing, uh, you know, some sort of uh, one of my favorites is uh, pretend you're the character and write diary episodes as if you were that character as a composition, right? So throughout it, they're interacting from the perspective of that character. Just happens to be a fun way to approach that project-based learning in a film. Also the back channel. Oh, this is so important. So instead of just having that passive alone experience of watching a movie in an online class, if you do it in Zoom or something like this, you can have the chat going on on the side. So as if you were in the same room with folks where you can literally be putting stuff in the chat like, oh, did you just see that? Oh, oh I can't believe that he said that. You know, the back channel is happening as the movie is playing. So it becomes more of an active process. And then, of course, valuing depth over breadth. It's this idea that, yes, you could have an overview discussion about the entire film, but you could also dig into that one cultural thing that happened in that one scene. And sometimes isn't that really more powerful, that depth, right, over breadth of the whole film. So if you're showing a film, but you know there's a scene where there's a particular aspect of the culture that you could discuss, that becomes really more powerful, actually. And in that project-based learning with that, you can have students exploring that, right, whatever that might be, that depth over breadth. So that's a little bit of some of my tips for using films in the online language classroom. But I would love, based on what we just chatted about, to see any of your takeaways or anything that stuck with you from those take one, take two scenarios. <laughs> you know, the take one isn't always the best, but the take two option is hopefully a little better. Any takeaways that stuck with you from integrating um, films? Shorter films often is, is a great way to go, especially at those lower levels where they can really, really dig deep into it. Talk about depth over breath, right? The investigate, mm-hmm. Investigate discussing key scenes. Yes, the muted scenes idea. I love that, the Zoom watch party, mm-hmm. I think those character, that character project-based learning can be really fun to really explore a film from the perspective of one character. Mm -hmm. The chat, the back channel chat. I love back channel chat during movies in the online classroom. I really feel like it adds a lot and you feel like you can actually, I mean, there's a reason that watch parties are you know, popular in the real world as well, right? <laughs> there's a reason that they're popular out there these days during the pandemic. And so if you can recreate that concept in your classes, that's really wonderful. Great. Thanks for sharing your takeaways. And that means we get to jump into a little bit about podcasts, which, you know, another form of media that we can really have fun with in the online language classroom. And here we are. 
with some of those benefits of the podcast. What I love is this picture, actually. Imagine this is a student of yours, if you teach this level of students. And imagine that this student is interacting with a podcast about their target language while waiting for the subway, right? What I love about podcasts is that you are so untethered when you use podcasts. They're very mobile friendly. You can take them with you and use them during your idle time. So we know our students are busy, but we know that they have idle time waiting for the bus, waiting for a family member, you know, um, in between classes, hanging out. So it's perfect for those idle times. It allows that untethered access. It's also easy on the eyes. And I don't know about you, but during this pandemic, don't you feel like your eyes get a workout because you're often in front of a screen and you're trying to you know, interact with that screen and the visual. So a little bit of something that you interact with listening is really wonderful, right? And then there's really something for everyone out there with podcasts because unlike films, podcasts are pretty easy to create. That means you have a wide variety. And so you'll notice in my online resource folder that I'm sharing with you all, there are so many options for podcasts. There's something literally for everyone. They're also DIY friendly. So in case you don't know what DIY means, do it yourself friendly. That means that if you get into podcasts, you can start creating your own podcast for your students and using that as a model. And you can in fact, maybe even get the students involved. Because again, it doesn't require like a film, all of the, you know, what do you want to say? All of the tech experience and knowledge to do it. When it comes, here we go again, that pedagogical purpose. You know me, we're going to always talk about integration with, with media and tech. We want to make sure we're deeply integrating it into the course. So there's kind of, I'm going to argue like three different ways, main ways you might embrace podcasts. Professional development is a big one, the language latte, right? That's a great professional development example of a podcast. Also, in the case of students, they can use podcasts to learn the language, right? To literally watch podcasts about different verb forms or things about the language that they can learn from the podcast, but then also to learn in the language, which there's kind of that translation, transition as they get to intermediate and advanced where they can start learning in the language with podcasts in the language. So those are kind of three different ways you might consider how you might use podcasts. So I'm just curious here in Mentimeter, off the top of your head, what type of uh, podcast might you be likely to use? with your students, ones that maybe teach grammar or talk about culture or that share learning tips. And you can pick more than one uh, or podcasts that teach something in target language, meaning that learning in the language, learning in the language. It seems like uh, the culture is really winning here so far, but we'll see. <laughs> or that teach something in the language. I agree, there's something really wonderful for students to experience learning in the language. Mm -hmm. And culture, I can see, is a big one. And that is a fun way to experience culture through a podcast. Thanks so much for voting on this one. So when it comes to integrating those podcasts, we're going to call this episode one, integrating podcasts. Okay, This is episode one of our podcast for the day. Enrichment activities. So sometimes podcasts just become that thing that you recommend to students, but don't necessarily require. Okay, so an enrichment activity. We all know we have students out there who want that enrichment, who want to, hey, you know, I really want to learn this language. And I spend two hours in a car each day driving to and from somewhere, you know, could I, is there a podcast I could be using? Yes, that's a great enrichment activity. Remedial activities as well. So if you have a student who really is struggling, but might just need a little more exposure to something, it can be a great remedial activity. And then, of course, as an instructional activity, you can assign it. Podcasts are a great assignment. I definitely assign podcasts. Um, and so it can be a way to really expose students to a particular concept, culture, grammar, whatever it is, as an assignment. And, of course, the concept of the listening comprehension. And not only that, but it's different from films, right? Because you don't have the visual context. So it's truly a listening comprehension, comprehension practice without that visual context. It's also a great conversation starter. So if you know you want to get those students talking back to those challenges of online teaching, remember everyone was very worried in that initial poll about getting students talking. Well, if you can get them engaging with a podcast they, that might really make them want to say something, right? Might really motivate them to try to talk about something. Definitely some good topics out there. 
And then also in the form of assessment, I don't know if you all use IPAs, the integrative performance assessments, but podcasts can be a great part of that. Because if you think about it, the interpretive task could be listening to the podcast, right? And then the interpersonal task could be talking to your classmate about it. And the presentational task could be making your own podcast. I mean, it could go that far or it could, you know, be something maybe in writing as well or whatever, but definitely it, it works well and functions well as part of an IPA. So that's just a little about integrating those podcasts. We'll call that episode one of our podcast here today. Present, pretend, pretending we're doing a podcast. Here we go. Now, episode two would be selecting a podcast. If you're planning to use one that you didn't yourself make. Definitely consider the pedagogical purpose. So back to that thing about, am I trying to do enrichment, remedial activities? Is this more instructional? What's my goal here? Do I want students learning in the language or learning about the language? You know, that's really gonna be your starting point. Definitely read the reviews because there are lots of reviews out there. And like I said, in the online folder of materials I'm sharing with you, there's a surplus of lists of different podcasts you can check out for different languages. Read the reviews, see what people are saying about them. And listen in, definitely listen in and for that, for that correct level for your students to make sure that it's at a level they can access. One way to help with that, and also for different concerns related to universal design, some podcast series will have transcripts readily available. So you may want to consider that as well. I know that um, when I teach at the high school level, I definitely always looked for a transcript too, because there were just many reasons um, that that might have been a useful tool as well. And then providing options for students. Think about that. You know, could you possibly provide a few different options so that students are actually selecting the one that really interests them the most, right? And maybe even that leads to some sort of project-based work in groups because the student chooses which podcast to interact with and then that naturally puts them into a group and that group can engage in their project-based learning and project-based assessment and it really lends itself to a nice experience. So that's episode two, selecting a podcast. Now, episode three is where the fun really begins. The DIY podcast. Are you ready for this? Notice the podcast planner. Here we go. But you can create wonderful instructional podcasts. And in some ways, it's less intimidating than creating instructional videos. Uh, because you can be doing more, you know, your, your face isn't on there, you can be a little more natural, possibly, and you're modeling and you can address um, frequently asked questions. These are two of my favorite reasons to make a podcast, actually. One is to model something. So in other words, I, I find a friend because podcasts are wonderful in groups of two or three. Find a friend or two and figure out how to do a podcast where you're modeling some sort of concept or you know conversation style whatever it is you're modeling it in the podcast or possibly addressing frequently asked questions about something they're learning in class and again find a friend you know um, to come in and record that with you on that note interviewing guest speakers is wonderful uh, so not necessarily about the frequently asked questions or the modeling but cultural things you know bring in a guest speaker and have them talk about you know, whatever it is that relates to your class, maybe where they're from, maybe, um, you know, they're, they're, they're anything about their culture. That can be a wonderful way because I noticed many of you were interested in podcasts about culture. That's a great one. Or be your own guest speaker. This is fun too. switch it up, have somebody interview you and you are the guest speaker in your own podcast. And you have a world of experience to share with your students. Or be a storyteller. Use a podcast as an opportunity to tell stories about something that you've experienced, maybe your travel experiences or your experiences as a student learning the language, if that is your, in, in fact, in your background. And then get your students involved. Why not? So students can also create podcasts. Right. And you can think about if they've already listened to many and they've seen great models of podcasts, getting them involved isn't that hard. And in some ways, they might like it better than video assignments where there's a little more intimidation of being on video, right, where the podcast has that sort of hidden thing. And on that note, I would say that the reason to get your students involved 
has to do with the four C's of the 21st century skills. And this is the idea of critical thinking, creativity, communication, collaboration. It's really our job as teachers, when we use technology, yes, we use technology to engage our students and present content, but it's also wonderful when we can put that technology into the hands of our students. So if we can reach the level where they are the ones creating the podcast, using the technology in that way to be creative and communicate and collaborate, all of those things, that just takes it that one step further, right? Um, and on that note, I have a little poll for you. Now that we've talked about podcasts, how likely are you to recommend optional podcasts to your students? Maybe assign podcasts for your students or create your own podcast or maybe even have students create podcasts. Just curious. It goes from very likely to not likely. Just curious where we're at with this right now. It looks like we are not as likely to create our own. <laughs> yep, it's always a little more intimidating. And you'll find that after you start listening to a lot of podcasts, that may change. You know, that may change. Uh huh. But it seems like we're pretty comfortable. We're kind of in the middle, actually. This I love this group. We're we're not really afraid. You know, we're we're kind of in the middle. We might just take this on yet. There's a little bit of fearlessness about this group. And again, it kind of goes in order, right? Like you might start out with, when you're new to using podcasts, you might start out with just that option of recommending podcasts because you kind of want to see, well, how's this going to go? So that's a great way to get your feet wet with podcasts. And then you might move from just recommending optional ones into possibly assigning some because now you have a little more confidence in how they work which then might lead you into creating your own podcast after you've gotten a little more comfortable. And then finally, I think once you get to that point, you might be more comfortable guiding students to create their own. Because of course, once you've had your own experience with it, you might be more likely to feel comfortable having them make their own. Thanks though for voting on that. So with that in mind, I know we have some stuff in the chat too, and Danielle's going to help me out, but we want to take your questions, and I hope I left enough time for that, but you can type questions right into Mentimeter. So on this slide, you can type questions in here and they'll appear on the screen, and Danielle's going to help me with those questions in the chat too. How are we doing in the chat, Danielle? Well, Kate, we have a few about podcasts and then going back to films, we've got a few already. So let's start with this question, are most prod podcasts free? Yeah, are most podcasts free? You know, I would argue that all the ones that I use are. So there's such a plethora of free ones. Yes, there are podcasts that cost money, but I wouldn't think you would need to go that route unless you had a very, very unique and that kind of niche sort of need for a particular type of podcast. So as you look at the resources in the online folder, you will discover almost all of them are free resources, right, for podcasts in many different languages. And we'll, again, don't worry about, we'll get that link up for you for the for the online folder of materials. Mm -hmm. That's great. And it sounds like that kind of takes care of this next question. If you have any recommended podcasts or apps. I do. And since I knew today we were going to have folks from so many different languages, I didn't really want to attempt to try to share them with you out loud. But for that reason, in the resource folder, you will see there's a huge there's several many, I mean, there's several resources with lists of potential podcasts, in, including sort of a master list that's in the sort of a separate document in the resource folder as well. And I would encourage you to, to check those out because there are so, so, so many. That's the thing about podcasts since they're so easy to make. There is a little something for everyone. Mm -hmm. Looks like on the screen, we have a question. What app do you use to record a DIY podcast? Yeah, you know, I am really low tech with that. I use anything, any recording equipment that I have available to me. So through uh, your school, you often maybe have access to a particular technology that can record your voice. I mean, that's really all you need is a particular technology that can record your voice. It's helpful if you can make sure to have a decent microphone, maybe do a little test, make sure you have a clear microphone. But that's the nice thing about podcasts is you can really use anything. I mean, I know a lot of people who just do it right off their mobile devices. Um, I happen to use... Um, you know, programs through my college, we have a program called um, Yuja, which allows you to record your voice and store files really easily. So I happen to use that. But you could really use any device that allows you to record your voice. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's so it's just really nice and user friendly in that sense. Whoops, let me get back here. Oh, we have a question here. Can you facilitate the link? Um, oh, 
sorry, it just jumped. Can you oh, facilitate the link to the podcast resources? Yes, definitely. Um, the very next slide, I will give you the link, but it's basically a short address. It's bit.ly slash, um, and now I'm trying to remember, is it film? Yeah, films podcast. So it's bit.ly slash films podcast if you type that into your browser, but we'll have it up for you in a second here too. And what activities can we create for analyzing and creating podcasts for communicative competence? Mm hmm so what activities can we create for analyzing and creating podcasts? Mm -hmm. I actually really, if I'm going to ask students to create podcasts, I definitely usually have them listening to a podcast in advance of that. Like, I don't want to just say, hey, create a podcast. So I always have them listening to some sort of a podcast that I consider to be a model of what maybe I'm looking for. You know, so I want them to have the experience of listening to a podcast before they create a podcast. I just feel like that's sort of fair and it provides a little extra scaffolding. And when it comes to, you know, the communicative competence, like in um, my department, we work a lot with the actual oral proficiency scale. So our rubrics are generally related to that. We have um, department, we've developed um, department rubrics that talk about, you know, that com the communicative competence, and we use those um, throughout for all of our speaking and oral type assessments. And so those can work really nicely for the podcast assignments too. Great. Uh, and if maybe we could go back to a few earlier questions about films. Yeah. Um, one question that was shared was, um, do you have a resource list for short films in Spanish? I do. So in the, um, and, and maybe I should just um, actually here in a second, pull up here one second. Let me just pull that up because I feel like that's going to be useful. Let me just get out of here for one second. Do you still see my screen? I can't tell if I took it off. No, it doesn't look like you're sharing. All right, one second, good, because then I will just pull up this folder because I think you'll find it useful to just give you a little tour of what you're going to find. So let me share it back over. So when you go in to the resource folder, you're gonna find a list of language uh, learning podcasts. This is kind of a very large list and it's literally by language. Um, so, it, well, it, first of all, it gives you some, some major podcasts and like tells you what languages are available in those particular podcasts. Um, so I wanna give you a tour of that. Then there's also going to be a resource list. And within here, you're going to find a bunch of articles that also list things. And actually one of them, I hate to say it, but one of the best lists out there for films is, let's see if I can find it, um, is actually from Babbel. It's a free you know, post on their um, site. So if you look, there's a couple different, couple different um, links here from Babbel. And they have some of the best recommendations actually <laughs> for some of the short films that I like. So if you wanna check out the Babbel resources here, I would highly recommend that. And then you have our slides from today, which I will update with all of the, the stuff that you all entered um, later today. So it will show up with all of that in there. And then there's also the teacher toolkit for using film to teach languages. So all of this will be in your resource folder, which you will access simply by going to bit.ly slash films podcasts. That's all you have to type in and it opens up. That's great. Well, while we're waiting for other questions to come into the chat box, um, I know I really enjoyed exploring language latte and I'm wondering, do you have any other favorite PD resources? You know, it is interesting. Mine vary so much that um, I'm trying to think actually, um, I may have to add something to our list of resources. I'm gonna do that actually, because I'm gonna add, uh, I'm just gonna make a note here to add um, some additional professional developments because admittedly the ones that I have here so far are more about student focused. You're so right. Like they're more about student focused, like using them with students. But I will add a few of my favorites in here um, for anyone who wants to look at professional development podcasts. Thanks for bringing that up, Danielle. For sure. And That's I the nice thing about the online folder. I can add stuff and it will show up there for you later. And I see people have been adding a lot of great resources too in the chat box. Yeah. Um, the Berkeley Language Center. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. 
Um, I have another question too. Um, so you mentioned how interesting it is to use a back channel on Zoom with uh -huh. students when they're watching films. Just curious if you or maybe anyone else too has an idea on using back channel if you're watching films in the class. Back channel on films in the class. Absolutely. Sorry, there goes my my coworker. Sorry about that. Um, goodness. One second. I will let you meet my coworker. I'm a fan of inviting our fuzzy coworkers into the world that we live in, all working from home, so many of us. So this is Ava, my fuzzy coworker. Um, but so, so um, go ahead and can you just remind me of your question? I got distracted there, Danielle. Oh, absolutely. Um, for using a back channel in the classroom while watching yes. films rather than online. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the same tools really can be used like in the, you know, in the, um, in the classroom as well. Like I use, um, I actually use Mentimeter a lot, to be honest, because it's so friendly for mobile devices. Now that would be assuming that you are allowing students to use mobile devices, which I know not all folks do, but Mentimeter is a really great way to have a back channel live during an in-person class. Because as you noticed, you can put up the option of just sort of, you know, you can put up different things. You can put up even little questions about the film, you know, so like you could say, well, what do you think of that? And have people, you know, reacting as they watch the film. But also you can have those open-ended ones where folks Folks can just put up open-ended comments as you saw. So I really actually like to use Mentimeter for the back channel in person. It's mm -hmm. a great question. That's a great idea. Okay, there are some other questions coming in. Um, oh, are we... All who are registered getting link for this presentation. Um, yes, I believe so, right, Carmen? Yes. Yep. <laughs> and here is actually, for those of you who are QR scanners, um, this is a QR scanner again, where you can get to the, um, you know, to the resource, the online folder of resources, or you can type in the bit.ly slash films podcasts, or you certainly are welcome to email me or connect with me on social media as well. If you have any follow-up questions, or if you just, you know, after you have a chance to look through some of the resources, if you have any additional questions about any of that, feel free to reach out. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, we've got a couple more coming in. Okay, just a lot of people saying thank you. This has been wonderful, all the resources you're sharing. Um, I do have one other question for you, Kate. Um, do you use any particular platform when you, um, when you push the, for example, podcasts out to students? Um, one popular platform might be um, Edpuzzle, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it depends on what I'm using the podcast for. Um, I do, you know, like if you if you have a learning management system of some kind that you use, I mean, oftentimes I'm linking podcasts through their learning through the learning management system, um, whether that might be Blackboard or Brightspace or Moodle or, you know, Google Classroom or whatever, you can easily post links to these different podcasts. Um, there's one called Zero to Hero or something like that, that <laughs> I find my students really love. I was just thinking about that. I just recently linked that to them in their, uh, you know, in it, through, a, through a learning management system. So, so I think that that's probably the easiest way to do it. But if you don't have a learning management system, then you might be, I mean, you know, these are usually linkable. So you, any which way that you share a link, you can share a podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. And uh, the final question here says, please wear the links of what you showed on the screen. Um, that's all just found at that bit.ly, correct, Kate? It is the bit.ly slash films podcast, or you can scan this code and it will take you to the folder. Yeah. That's great. One of the um, language latte uh, podcasts that I listened to was about slowing down audio. Yep. Do, you, do you use that a lot? 
So some podcasts will have that option, not all, but some will have that option to slow speed. And that would be another thing to consider when you're choosing your podcast, if you think that's a useful tool for students. Um, I sometimes am of the belief that I, you know, like I go back and forth on that. Sometimes I want there to be that option for students. And sometimes I don't, depending on whether I'm trying to get sort of a more, you know, we always joke about how people in real life don't have the slow down button, but <laughs> in the real world. But so it sort of depends on, my, again, your pedagogical purpose and your methodology behind using the podcast. But that is something that you can watch for when you're looking at different podcasts. Some will have it, some won't. Just like how some will have transcripts readily available and others will not, depending on how you need those resources. But those are the two sort of bigger, I guess what I would say, sort of accessibility or universal design components to consider when you're choosing your podcast. That's great. Thank you for that. Are there any final questions from anyone? I don't think so. If I go back to the question okay. one, two. But I also wanted to give a big shout out to all of our sponsors today because I think it's really wonderful uh, to bring language teachers together. I love being in a room full of language teachers, whether it's a virtual room or an in-person room. It's so wonderful to be together. So thanks to all of our sponsors for bringing this uh, event into, into being for today and for Danielle for helping with the moderation. Definitely. And thank you, Kate. Um, thank you one more time for such a thought provoking presentation. That was really wonderful. There's so much information there for all of us. Um, and as you said, one more thank you to today's sponsors, the Institute for Regional and International Studies National Resource Center, the Wisconsin Intensive Summer Language Institutes, the Language Institute at UW-Madison, and the Wisconsin Associ Association for Language Teachers. And Carmen has entered a few reminders and links to upcoming events, so please be sure to check those out in the chat box. And thank you to everyone for attending this afternoon, and hope you have all have a great evening. Thanks, everyone.